good afternoon. In our series of animal biotechnology, we have been doing recombinant DNA technology in which we talk about how the foreign DNA is inserted into uh, bacterial colonies or uh, microbes, animal cells or plant cells. Under recombinant DNA technology, we have been talking about cloning vectors and till now we have discussed about the bacterial cloning vectors and higher capacity bacterial cloning vectors such as artificial chromosomes etc. Today we will be continuing with the cloning vectors in our fourth session and we will talk about the cloning vectors of eukaryotes. The learning objectives for this session would be to study the yeast cloning vectors, to talk about the cloning vectors for plants and to talk about various cloning vectors for animals. So basically in eukaryotes we will talk about the different cloning vectors. The references are generally T. A. Brown and Odom. The references are given on the screen. They are important references and used only for the educational purposes. So, cloning vectors for eukaryotes will start with the yeast cloning vectors, and there are a variety of yeast cloning vectors which are used, termed as YEPs, YIPs, PYRPs, and YAKs. So, we'll take one by one and talk about their characteristics, properties, and application. YEP vectors or the yeast episomal plasmid vectors are based on the two micromolar plasmid present in most strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So isolated from the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the natural plasmid 2 micro m plasmid is then modulated to form the yeast episomal plasmids. This is the yeast 2 micromolar plasmids and as you can see there are two REP1 and REP2 which are involved in the replication of the plasmid are there. The 2 micromolar plasmid is basically a basis for a cloning, excellent basis for the cloning vector. It is 6 kb in size and it is assist in the yeast cell as a copy number of between 70 and 200. The replication makes use of a plasmid origin, several enzymes provided by the uh, host cell and the proteins coded by the REP1 and REP2 genes carried by the plasmid. So, the REP1 and REP2 gene products are used for the replication of the plasmid and therefore it is replicating in the Saccharomyces cerevisiae and the genes are cloned in that. Then several other enzymes are provided by the host cell for its maintenance and replication. An example of a yeast episomal plasmid is shown here which is a YEP13 molecule and this YEP13 molecule as you can see contains the important genes and the origin of replication. So, it has got a resistant gene for the marker and other different uh, genes which are present. The gene leucine 2 is an important gene which codes for the beta isopropyl mutate dehydrogenase. It is one of the enzyme involved in the conversion of pyruvic acid to leucine. So, this is for the, uh, for the formation of amino acid leucine and this gene is located on this yep plasmid. Now, leucine 2 act as a selectable marker. So, while we have been discussing various bacterial plasmids, we have been discussing the importance of a selectable marker uh, for an ideal cloning vector. And that is when a vector is introduced into a host cell, then one is able to select those cells which have taken up the, uh, taken up the vector molecule or recombinant vector molecule containing the gene of interest. So, selectable marker distinguishes between the uh, non-vector containing and vector containing molecules or recombinant and non-recombinant molecules. So, in this YEP vector, the leucine 2 act as a selectable marker. It is basically a special kind of host organism. It needs a special kind of host organism and the host must be an oxotrophic mutant that has a non-functional LU2 gene. Since it is involved in the conversion of pyruvic acid to leucine, so the formation of leucine requires the functional copy of the leucine 2 to be present. Now, Saccharomyces cerevisiae oxotrophic mutant basically means that it is not able to synthesize the leucine 2 on its own, but the leucine has to be provided in the medium for it to metabolize. So, such mutants are termed as oxotrophic mutants. Now, when this particular vector is introduced into the uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, then they will convert because this vector is carrying this leucine 2 molecule, 
therefore the cells will convert prototrophic or they will start synthesizing their leucine and will not be dependent upon the uh, external leucine which should be present. So, on minimal medium whatever the colonies grow that means they are synthesizing their amino acid and therefore they can uh, you know uh, grow on their own and do not require the presence of leucine in the medium. So, that way one can select the presence of a YEP13 mole uh, vector molecule which is there. So, such a leucine to minus yeast is unable to synthesize leucine and therefore can survive only if the amino acid is supplied in a nutrient medium in the growth medium. So, it is you know the oxotrophic mutants require the presence of certain essential amino acids in the medium and only then they can grow. So, we use leucine 2 minus yeast as a host and when the YEP vector is introduced into it, it becomes leucine 2 plus positive and therefore, it can be selected by growing on a minimal medium. So, the, this is basically showing that how the uh, you know when you grow it on a minimal medium, then you can uh, select the positive clones which are basically there. The selection is possible because the transformants contain a plasmid uh, born copy of the leucine 2 gene and so are able to grow in the absence of the amino acid in a cloning experiment and therefore leucine 2 act as a selectable marker. The cells are plated out into the minimal medium which contains no added amino acid and only transformed cells are able to survive and form colonies. So, as we have discussed for an ideal cloning vector, a selection mechanism should be well in place and for yeast episomal plasmids such as this particular plasmid, leucine 2 or the oxotrophic and prototrophic selection becomes the uh, selection criteria for the transformed colonies. YEP13 is also a shuttle vector that is it includes the entire PBR332 sequence and can uh, therefore replicate and be selected uh, for uh, in, uh, in the yeast as well as E. coli. So, what are shuttle vectors that they contain two origin or multiple origin of replication so that they can survive in two different organisms. For example, YEP13 is a yeast molecule, but it also contains the PBR332 origin which is for the bacterial replication and therefore, it can also replicate in the E. coli. So, what is the uh, significance or uh, you know usage of these shuttle vectors is that because genetic manipulation is easier in E. coli and because this plasmid can also replicate in E. coli then all the applications, all the manipulations, the cloning etcetera can be done in E. coli and then the plasmid can be transferred into the yeast. So, every time for all the cloning purposes you do not require the yeast molecules as the higher eukaryotic molecules are generally difficult to manipulate or maintain in the lab conditions. So, when the vector many uh, you know all the uh, insertion of the uh, gene of interest etcetera can be done in E. coli and then the selected uh, uh, recombinant plasmids can then be isolated and introduced into this yeast molecule and because they are shuttle vectors and contain origin of replication for both E. coli and the yeast they can survive and propagate in both the uh, organism. So, shuttle vectors become very important when such kind of manipulations need to be done. Uh, now, initial cloning experiment is done in E. coli and the recombinants are selected in this organism. The recombinant plasmids can then be purified, characterized and corrected uh, molecule are introduced into the yeast. So, it give an easy mechanism for the genetic manipulation, but the required expression in the whatever organism for example, in yeast which we require here. So, this becomes this is the significance of the shuttle vectors why it is there. So, this is showing the same thing that e the manipulations can be done there and then they are glow grown on the colonies and when the colonies are grown then the transformants are selected and they can be introduced and then introduced into the yeast cells and then on yeast these cells they can be selected on the minimal media and the positive uh, you know the growing colonies because they do not require amino acid they can synthesize own amino acid because of the presence of the leucine 2 can then be selected. So, the recombinant plasmid selection and formation can be done in E. coli, but then the final uh, uh, transformation can be done in the yeast molecules for its uh, whatever uh, manipulation what we use it for. 
the yep may insert into the yeast chromosomal dna now episome basically stands for the uh, uh, for the explanation that uh, episomal basically means that they can replicate on their own they have their origin of replication but they can also insert into the chromosomes so there is an uh, integration can also occur so as you can see the uh, mutant copy of the leucine 2 gene you know recombination can occur between the leucine 2 genes and the plasmid can be incorporated into the chromosome so again you uh, you know it depends upon the kind of requirement you want if you want a stable expression of the uh, gene of interest which is incorporated into this plasmid then this integration can also be useful but otherwise if you want to isolate or increase the copy number of the particular gene which you are introducing in the uh, in the yeast then uh, uh, you know it can also stay uh, uh, as a uh, as a separate entity in the cell and then then can be isolated and characterized so uh, this is the usefulness of yeps that they can be inserted into the yeast chromosomal dna and as shown here the recombination occurs between the mutant leu2 gene and the functional leu2 gene which the uh, plasmid is carrying because of the homology so uh, the, the recombination occurs and the plasmid can be inserted into the chromosomes uh, then comes the uh, YIPs or YIPs vectors or YIP they are called as the yeast integrative plasmids. They are the bacterial plasmids carrying a yeast gene. So, they are again plasmids, they are again the PBR 322 uh, with origin, but they contain the isolated DNA such as the uh, isolated gene such as URA, URA. 3 gene. So, you can see that this is a YIP plasmid, it is an integrative plasmid. So, as against the YEPs which are episomal plasmids, these are integrative plasmids. So, integrative plasmids can be you know essentially integrate into the chromosome and they contain special genes again such as the in this case it is containing a URA3 gene. Now, URA3 codes for uh, the uh, uh, phosphate decarboxylase uh, an enzyme that catalyzes one of the steps in the biosynthesis pathway for uh, pyrimidine nucleotides and is used as a selectable marker just like leucine 2. So, just like leucine 2 again this marker is used for because it is again for the synthesis of a particular nucleotide which is there. So, for this pyrimidine nucleotide synthesis if you do not incorporate it, if you do not provide it in the medium then only the transformants can grow. So, URA3 is used for the selection of these particular uh, recombinant plasmids. Then a YIP cannot replicate as a uh, as a plasmid uh, as it does not contain any parts of the 2 mu m plasmid and instead depends for its survival on integration into the yeast chromosome. DNA integration occurs uh, just as described for a YEP. So, DNA interaction occurs because there is a mutant URA3 gene in the host and the uh, functional URA3 gene of the vector can recombine and integrate into the host. But integration here is essential because it is basically a bacterial plasmid which is carrying the yeast genes. It is not a 2 mu m plasmid. So, it does not contain the uh, you know uh, it does not contain the machinery so that it can replicate as a separate plasmid inside the yeast cells. So, when it is introduced into the yeast cells, they integrate into the chromosome and therefore confer the, uh, the, uh, the properties of the gene of interest that has been cloned into that particular vector. Then comes the YRPs vectors and YRPs vectors are yeast replicative plasmids. They are the plasmids carrying the yeast genes with replication origins located close to them. Uh, one or two of the genes can be used as selectable marker and ye they multiply as independent plasmids. So, basically YEPs have the possibility of in integrating into the chromosome but also replicating separately. YIPs or YEPs are basically the integrative plasmids. They cannot replicate inside the yeast whole cells but they have to integrate into the genome and YRPs are the replicative plasmids. They cannot integrate into the genome but they can only occur as the replicative plasmids. So, you know we will see that how or uh, why how we choose whether we have to use a YEP, YEP or YRPs vectors but these are the certain properties of these particular vectors that how they work. So, they can multiply as independent marker uh, plasmids they also contain selectable marker genes but they also contain multiple or single origin of replication so that they can replicate inside the yeast host cells. 
so this is an example uh, of a yrp which is basically containing the uh, you know travan it's it's a, it's a gene such as uh, this trp1 and this contains the origin of replication along with it so this is the yeast fragment which is coming as you can see again the uh, the basic framework of this particular plasmid is pbr322 only so pbr322 but it does contain a yeast fragment containing a particular gene and with the origin of replication which is there the dna fragment present uh, has the uh, this particular gene which can be used for the selection or other genes antibiotic resistant genes can be used for selection but they also contain origin of replication for replicating inside the yeast host cell so you know uh, what are the criteria for choosing when you are doing a cloning the in yeast that you have want to use a yep yep or yrp molecule so one of the factors to decide is the transformation efficiency as you can see here so transformation efficiency refers to the number of transformants obtained per microgram of the dna introduced so whatever amount of you know 1 microgram of plasmid dna or the vector dna which you are introducing into your host cell and then you count the number of transformants which are there then that tells you the transformation efficiency higher the transformation efficiency it is better particularly when you just want to clone the gna fragment or you want to isolate a particular gene of interest uh, in bulk so that way the transformation higher the transformation efficiency it will be better uh, for the uh, genetic manipulation that we are doing so as you can see that yeps have uh, produces around 10 to 100 1000 uh, transformants per microgram of dna yrps produces 1 to 10000 uh, transformants per microgram per dna and yips are least amount you know they produce less than 1000 transformants per microgram of dna so it uh, the transformation efficiency basically decreases in this order and therefore depending upon our need that whether we require a very high transformation efficiency or we can do with a you know medium uh, transformation efficiency uh, our choice will be to choose a particular yeast vector the second thing is the copy number so copy number is again very important and copy number refers to the number of plasmids present in a cell so higher the copy number there is a more chances that you know there there is a uh, tendency to have higher uh, gene of interest in uh, from a single particular cell so even if the efficiency is low the copy number is high then still you are able to get a large amount of uh, your gene of interest so uh, in uh, for the copy number yeps and yrps have high copy number. numbers for yrps it ranges from 5 to 100 and for yep it ranges from uh, 20 to 50 kbs yep however are very low and it produces only uh, for it has only one uh, plasmid per cell so looking at these two factors one would assume, you know one would speculate that why in fact use yeps because uh, their copy number is low their transformation efficiency is low but still at places we use uh, yip vectors for uh, cloning in yeast and the uh, and the factor uh, which is kept in mind for using yip is the stability of the recombinants the stability of the recombinants is basically in this order for yip it is the highest uh, stability of recombinants is there so by stability of recombinants we basically means because the plasmid is introduced into the yeast host cells and it integrates into the genome there is less tendency that over the generations it will be lost however in yep and yrp because in the yrp you know it is remaining as a replicative plasmid the plasmid curation can occur which is basically the loss of plasmids over subsequent generations so if one needs the stability of recombinants then yep is the choice of uh, uh, you know preferred choice for cloning so yep yep and yrp the uh, the choice is basically because of that yeast artificial chromosomes uh, we then talk about the higher capacity uh, vectors for yeast which are termed as the yeast artificial chromosomes uh, what happens the name suggests is that they are some artificial so we understand what chromosomes are so chromosomes are basically that dna molecules containing some important components for example the centromere when they condensed you know in the metaphase stage to form chromosome chromosomes so in a cell the dna is present in the chromatin form but then when they have to divide and when they have to condense they form the chromosomes and this condensed form has certain important regions such as the centromeric region or at the ends the telomeric regions and all those regions 
if uh, and you know these chromosomes also uh, can carry the DNA molecule. So, if we synthesize such chromosomal molecules artificially containing the important components of the chromosomes as well as making it so that it can contain or carry the uh, gene of interest, it will be a very useful uh, cloning vector and it will be a very high capacity cloning vector because chromosomes carry a large amount of DNA as compared to the uh, smaller vectors which we are using. So, uh, so you know uh, when we have to insert large fragments then the yeast artificial chromosomes can be or the artificial chromosomes can be utilized. Uh, the key components of chromosomal structures are basically the centromeres, the telomeres and the origin of replication. So, centromere is the central part where the two chromatids are joined, telomeres are referred to the uh, end of the chromosomes and then there are multiple origins of replication spread throughout the uh, gene uh, throughout the chromosome that causes the DNA to replicate. These components are then used to create the artificial chromosomes in vitro. They can have a tendency to clone long pieces of DNA. For example, this is a yeast artificial chromosome shown here which is a PEAC3 molecule. It is again a PBR322 plasmid into which the number of yeast genes have been uh, uh, inserted. Then apart from these, it contains the two genes which we have talked about the URA, URA3 and the TRP1. Now, t this fragment containing TRP1 also contains the chromosomal origin of replication. So, you can see that there are uh, you know chromosomal origin of replication which is located in here. Then the fragment also include the sequence called as uh, this which is the uh, DNA from the centromeric region of chromosome. So, they also have a CEN4, CEN4 region which is basically from the chromosome 4 the centromeric region is also there. So, the fragment contain the two genes which can be used as a selectable marker. So, it is just like uh, you know uh, the episomal plasmids or the integrative plasmids we have discussed. But now the capacity will be very high because we are inserting the components of the chromosomes into it. So, you have multiple origin of replications, you have a centromeric region and then for the telomeric regions are also provided by the two sequences which are called as the tel sequences. They however, not themselves are complete telomeric sequences, but when they are introduced into the host, they act as the uh, you know uh, sequence where the telomeres can be built. So, you can see that there are two tel uh, telomeric regions, there is a CE region and then there is a uh, origin of replication which is there and then there are two genes which we have talked about URA3 and TRP1. So, such artificial chromosomes are termed as in this case the yeast artificial chromosomes. Then there is also a gene which is called as SUP4, SUP4 which is selectable marker on which the uh, DNA is uh, you know inserted during the uh, cloning experiment. So, for the uh, for the recombinant uh, artificial chromosome this sub 4 can be used and for the uh, manifestation the proper manifestation or the correction of the uh, recombinant the correct recombinant to be formed the selectable markers URA uh, you know TRP1 uh, and URA3 can be utilized. So, that is how the cloning uh, strategy works in case of PEAC3. So, what happens in this case is that it has been digested and you know you can have a linear uh, you can have fra fragments. So, the BAMH1 uh, uh, fragments in 3 fragments can be separated and there is a, this SNB1 uh, uh, restriction enzyme is used. So, uh, the fragments containing uh, both the sites BAMH1 flanking sites are discarded and then BAMH1 SNB1 and right and left arm are utilized to insert the genome. Now, uh, whatever gene of interest is there. So, such a kind of molecule which is formed, you know, that can be then introduced into yeast to select. But this is only the corrected thing which is there. So, if a recombinant plasmid or the presence of plasmid is there, then the, uh, you know, SNB is present inside the uh, CYP4 uh, gene. Uh, therefore, uh, the recombinant can be selected in a different manner and the useful transformant which contains this kind of a construct can be selected in again in a different manner, which is basically that the uh, the protoplast formation is gen transformation is used. We will talk about the transformation mechanisms later in our series, uh, but uh, you know uh, protoplast transformation is a special transformation method in which the gene of interest or the plasmid vectors are introduced into the protoplasts and then inserted into the host cell. So, such a kind of transformation method is used to introduce the artificial chromosomes uh, into the uh, sac Saccharomyces cerevisiae 
and it attain uh, then uh, a double uh, oxotrophic mutant is used which is basically TRP1 negative and URA3 negative. So, double mutant is utilized and the transformants are selected because they get transformed into TRP plus and URA3 and that is why I said that if only this correct uh, uh, construct is formed then only the cells will grow. If for example, the ligation had occurred only the two similar kind of arms are there or you know some uh, something has happened that both the genes are not present, then the uh, selection will not be there or it will not be selected. So, it helps you know double, uh, double gene selection also helps. So, you use a mutant which is TRP minus and uh, TRP1 minus and URA3 minus and it transforms into TRP plus and URA3 plus. Um, the transformants are selected by plating onto minimal media on which only uh, you know containing a, uh, a vector system is there. So, there is no uh, amino acid which is present there and therefore, they are containing then the promoter of this thing is will only incorporate. So, that uh, uh, you know if sub 4 is also there then which is also present by a single color must be visible. Uh, if you can see that the recombinant and the colonies are not red whereas, the sub 4 colonies will be inserted uh, would be colored red. So, there are two kind of selections which are happening here the sub 4 selection and the uh, amino acid uh, prototrophic conversion of the oxotrophic mutants which is happening there. Yeast episomal plasmids, yeast integrative plasmids, yeast replicative plasmids and yeast artificial chromosomes is what we have discussed till now in talking about the cloning vectors in eukaryotes particularly in the yeast system. So, those were basically based upon the uh, uh, you know particular yeast such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Then there are vectors for other yeasts and fungi which are used and the efficient integrative vectors are also available for a number of species including yeast such as Pistia pistorius and uh, you know other organisms such as the filamentous fungi for example, asparagus uh, indolence and neurospora crassa. So, various vector systems have been developed so as to introduce the foreign genes for expression or cloning purposes in these particular hosts. Now, further moving up and talking about the various cloning vectors in plants. So, cloning vectors for higher plants are based on naturally occurring plasmids of agrobacterium. Now, uh, you know there are no uh, naturally occurring plasmids that have been found uh, from, the, uh, from the plants, but uh, the plant associated microbe which is the agrobacterium tumorificens which we will talk about. The vectors based on its naturally occurring plasmid is used to introduce the foreign DNA into the gene into the higher plants. Uh, the direct gene transfer using various types of plasmid DNA and the vectors based on plant viruses. So, a cloning different cloning vectors we will talk under these particular heads. So, we will start with talking about the TI plasmid of the agrobacterium tumor physiage. Agrobacterium tumor physiens is a soil microorganism that causes crown, crown gall disease in many species of dicotyledonous plants. So, uh, various variety of species uh, give rise to this particular disease when there is an infection of this bacteria and that infection or the manifestation of this disease is caused by this particular plasmid, the TI plasmid which is present in this bacteria. So, as you can see that the crown gall occurs when a wound on the stem allows the A tumorificens to uh, uh, invade the plant and after the induction the bacteria causes a cancerous proliferation of the stem tissue in the region of the crown and therefore this kind of a nodule you know it is called as a crown gall disease because of that. So, whenever there is a wound this bacteria will infect and this bacteria will cause the proliferation or the tumorous cancerous kind of a growth in the gall region and you will see this crown gall uh, uh, tissue kind of a thing and it is termed as a crown gall disease and this is because of this A tumorificens. And this particular manifestation is because of this particular plasmid which is termed as the TI plasmid. Now, TI plasmid is uh, the name is basically the tumor inducing plasmid it is greater than 200 kb in uh, region and as you can see it contains the uh, a particular fragment of DNA termed as the tDNA. And then there are various virulous infection particles and there are other uh, genes which are located. So, the important fragment is the tDNA which is around 15 to 20 kb, 30 kb uh, size that integrates into the plant chromosomal DNA and uh, contains 8 to uh, 8 or so genes that are expressed in the plant cell and are responsible for this cancerous properties of the 
uh, transformed cell. These gels, uh, genes also direct the uh, uh, synthesis of the unusual compounds such as the opines that the bacteria uses as a nutrient. So, this is a very important and uh, interesting infective cycle because whenever there is a wound, this agrobacterium tumorificence is going to infect that uh, region and this plasmid is carrying the uh, you know 8 or so genes that are uh, expressed in the plant cell. So, this gene get introduced into the plant cell. So, from this bacteria the gene gets introduced into the plant cell and this uh, plant cell from this bacteria will then uh, express these particular genes and these genes uh, some of the genes would also uh, uh, result in the production of opines which will act as its nutrient and therefore the cancerous growth of the of the uh, cells will occur uh, resulting in the crown gall disease so this property is very useful to create the vector system uh, uh, for introduction of the foreign gene into the plants because as it is appearing here the tdna is carrying this 8 or 6 genes we can artificially insert or our gene of interest in place of these 8 or 6 genes and the tdna and then we put it into agrobacterium and the agrobacterium is going to infect the plant cell and introduce the tna so tdna we can produce as a recombinant ti plasmid and that recombinant ti plasmid will contain our gene of interest in this tdna and this recombinant plasmid will then be uh, uh, you know passed on to the plant cells by agrobacterium uh, tumorificence infection and in the plant cells these genes or our gene of interest will be uh, expressed and will result in a particular uh, you know our uh, uh, whatever uh, phenotype or whatever application we want to achieve. So, by introduction, so in that way the introduction of uh, foreign gene into the uh, plant cell can be facilitated. So, uh, now there are two strategies to use it because what happens is that this tDNA is only a small fragment of this tNDNA. Now, tumor inducing plasmid is approximately 200 kVs, it is a very large plasmid. Now, in large plasmid, if you want to introduce any particular gene, then there the problem occurs, there are two problems that occurs. One is that the size will, it will become more bulky and therefore, will be difficult to uh, uh, transform the plant cells and second thing is because it is 200 kb. So, you know, it will be very difficult to find any unique uh, cloning sites which is required for inserting the gene of interest. So, what the uh, researchers and scientists have found out is that the tDNA only by itself is uh, uh, responsible can can be uh, you know separately put into a plasmid and the gene of interest can be inserted. So, there are two strategies which they utilize one is called as the binary vector strategy and another is called as a co-integration strategy because what they have found is that you need not have all the machinery on a single vector. You can introduce the certain things on a separate vector which will help the infection to manifest and you can introduce your gene of interest into the tDNA contained on a smaller plasmid. So, as to the uh, you know the size limit or uh, unique restriction site problem is solved. When you have a smaller DNA containing the tDNA, there will be impossibility of having more unique uh, restriction sites where the cloning can be done. So, uh, one of the strategy uh, as represented here is a binary vector strategy. So, in binary vector strategy, you will have a smaller molecule containing the tDNA fragment and therefore, unique restriction sites where the genes can be cloned. And then uh, there is another vector that will be constructed and this vector will contain the infective genes or the host manifestation genes or the virulence genes uh, which will be responsible for the uh, transformation of these vectors. So, both the vectors can then be introduced because these products will help this uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, this TI plasmid, the tDNA containing plasmid to be introduced into the plast cell. So, the plasmids A and B complement each other when present together in the same cell and therefore, the, the tDNA fragment carries the in the plasmid B can contain large amount of foreign DNA as well as contain unique restriction sites where the DNA can be cloned and this plasmid A helps the uh, infection to occur and the transformation to take place. So, uh, another strategy is called as the co-integration strategy because what happens is when you want to introduce your uh, gene uh, into gene of interest into the tDNA into the TI plasmid, the one of the problem was that it does not contain unique restriction enzyme sites. Now, uh, uh, when we will talk in detail about the restriction, uh, uh, the recombinant DNA technology, the gene of interest can be introduced into the uh, 
cloning vector by digesting the cloning vector by particular restriction enzymes and digesting the insert also with the same enzymes and then incorporating inside it. Another method can be that if you have a homologous sequence and the recombination can occur and your gene can be actually inserted inside the tDNA. So, this is the tDNA containing Ti plasmid and if you have a gene which is a homologous, so you can see that there are certain homology in this particular area and then therefore, this but if, if you clone your, so you can clone your gene of interest in a smaller plasmid and by recombination that gene of interest along with this homologous tDNA fragment can then be introduced co-integrate into the Ti plasmid and the gene of interest will come here. So, binary vector strategy as well as co-integration strategy can be utilized because it was found that what is important is the tDNA. And in fact, later on it was found that in the tDNA also there are only 25 base pair repeater sequences which are important. So, if you keep those repeater sequences, it can inco insert and insert your gene into it and give the infection and host things uh, separately, then also you can introduce or transform the host cells by the foreign DNA. So, the production of transformant plant cells with the Ti plasmid occurs in this particular manner. Now, there are two uh, again uh, you know mechanisms or two uh, you know what, what are the consequences or what are the outcomes what we are looking for. One of the thing is if you if you follow the natural route because the natural route is that you introduce the Ti plasmid the recombinant Ti plasmid carrying your gene of interest into the agrobacterium uh, tumorificence and cause that agrobacterium uh, to infect the wounded region of the plant. When it infects the wounded region of the plant, it inserts into the plant cells of that area and that plant cells then grow, show the cancerous growth and appearance of the crown gall appears. Now, by this natural pathway, the transformed cells would only be these cells which are the crown gall cells and not the entire plant cell. So, if you want to have certain, uh, certain uh, you know, uh, uh, if you want to introduce certain gene of interest, for example, to create a herbicide resistant plant or a pesticide or some kind of an insect resistant plant, insect pathogen resistant plant. So, if you want to introduce that gene, it will be only these cells which will be uh, transformed and not the entire plant. So, another strategy is used in which the plant cells can be transformed in vitro and then the root and shoot can be grown and finally, the entire plant can come up. So, if the plant cells are uh, grown and infected or, uh, or, the trans or the only the Ti plasmid not even following the infection route, only the Ti plasmid is introduced. So, Ti plasmid is able to survive in the plant, uh, in the, uh, plant cells. And in fact, as I said, we, they will find, uh, you know, subsequently it was found that in the Ti plasmid, the tDNA and not even the entire tDNA, but only certain repeater sequences which are essential. So, if you just introduce those repeater sequences and introduce the insert uh, gene of interest in between it and then transform it into directly the plant cells, then those plant cells can be selected upon and grown in vitro for the appearance of root and shoot and the entire plant can be grown containing the transformed cells. So, this is also very important when you generate the entire plants and you just do not need a handful of cells which are transformed. Now, important aspect in this is because if you are introducing the Ti plasmid, as I said earlier that because if you are introducing the complete Ti plasmid, it also contains the infective uh, proteins etcetera then that infective thing has to be disarmed because we do not want the crown gall disease to appear in the transformed plant, but we want that the tDNA should be able to only transport our gene of interest, but do not infect the uh, uh, or do not cause the crown gall disease to uh, uh, proliferate or occur. So, for that the disarming of the Ti plasmid is very important. Now, uh, the regeneration of a transformed plant cells occur only if the Ti vector has been disarmed and that the transformed cells do not display any uh, diseased properties or any cancerous properties. So, then only it will be useful for us. So, for disarming uh, you know many things can be done and only parts of the tDNA which is involved in the infection are 225 base pair repeat sequences found at the left and the right borders of the region integrated the plasmid uh, the plant DNA. So, as you can see only this much is important. So, you can remove you do not follow 
follow the infective path at all, you, but you introduce the plasmoid by other transformation methods which we will study. So, in that case the tDNA will be able to take the uh, genes and, uh, and express those genes in the plasmid cells without causing the infection or disease of the plant. So, any DNA which is placed between these two repeat sequences will be treated as tDNA and transferred to the plea plant. However, it does not contain the infective proteins etcetera, so no infection would be there. So one of the disarmed uh, Ti binary vector is for example uh, shown here. The, uh, it contains only the left and right repeat sequences of the tDNA and it also contains the lag Z and, uh, and an antibiotic resistant gene for the selection. So, the disruption and the you know the polycloning site is uh, located here. So, you can just simply clone your gene of interest and manipulate it and you can just infect it into the uh, agrobacterium tumorificensis and you can uh, transform uh, you know you can uh, select upon the uh, uh, transformants based upon the insertional inactivation of the lag Z gene or antibiotic resistant marker for the presence of the plasmid and then you can isolate this recombinant plasmid and transform it directly into plant cell. This plasmid will then survive in the plasmid cells because it contains these two repeater sequences of the tDNA fragment. You do not require any other part of the tDNA also. So, that they subsequently found out and it was very important for example shown here. So, this plasmid can then be converted and directly added into across the plant cell and then it can be integrated also uh, and that uh, in can be uh, formulated the uh, entire thing which is there. Uh, the Ti plasmid can be formed there. So, this Ti plasmid as I said can uh, there is another method for introduction in plant which is the direct gene transfer. So, any other plasmid apart from the Ti, uh, TI, uh, uh, just the Ti plasmid also because Ti plasmid we generally follow the infection route. But if we are not following the infection route, you can directly transfer the gene. So, this is the plasmid containing only the repeats of tDNA or this is these are the plasmids, uh, any other plasmids which are important. So, you can just isolate the supercoiled plasmid DNA and put it across the plant cell. We will talk about these methods later. It can be biolistic method, it can be electroporation, it can be protoplast fusion. So, by any method, it is passed on to the plant uh, cell wall, it is introduced and then it can be integrated into gene genome to produce the recombinant molecules. So, this is a direct gene transfer. So, if we do not want to follow the natural pathway of the agrobacterium and there are certain genes which we can clone into different vectors, we can directly introduce it into the uh, plant cells by various transformation mechanism. The third type of cloning vectors which are used for plants are the plant viruses. So, plant viruses, uh, you know, uh, the, um, the first one to be used was the colimovirus vectors. Uh, the first successful plant genetic engineering experiments was done in uh, to using a colimovirus vector to uh, store, a, uh, you know, to clone a new gene into the turnip plants. So, what happens in this case is the viruses, you know, just like we, uh, we were using uh, bacteriophages in case of uh, bacteria. So, the similar cases that we use uh, viruses for construction of or the carrying of gene of interest and introduced into the plasma into the plant things. Now, there are two general difficulties which are encountered for the total genome size constraint to its the packaged into the protein coat. It is similar to what was found for the lambda bacteriophages. So, the uh, uh, you know you one has to have and because this uh, particular thing is uh, large uh, the colimovirus ve vectors if you use the entire genome then it is larger then the, there occurs the limitation of DNA that can be in inserted into this one. The second difficulty is the extremely narrow host range. They are restricted to mainly the brassica family such as turnips, cabbages and cauliflower. However, still they are very useful cloning vectors because of the economical significance of these particular plants and therefore, uh, possibility of doing genetic manipulations and uh, causing the genetically modified organisms to be produced. So, these are the two general difficulties. Uh, the narrow range is it's fine, but uh, this can be encountered again. Uh, uh, by the uh, the first problem can be circumvented by adapting the helper virus strategy as we used in the case of phagemids. The cloning vector is a cauliflower mosaic virus or uh, CMV genome that lacks several of the essential genes which means that it can carry a large DNA insert but 
uh, has to be uh, but cannot directly cause the direct infection. So, as basically what, uh, what happens is that we can take the properties of two different things and club them together. So, we can use a cauliflower mosaic virus and because uh, we have removed the essential genes now it can carry a large amount of DNA and infection part the uh, cauliflower vector can be utilized with. So, such a strategy can be encountered or uh, can be adopted so as to facilitate larger DNA inserts to be introduced into the plant cell using the cauliflower viruses. However, the uh, usefulness uh, 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 lies in the fact that it is used for the uh, uh, transformation of economically significant uh, dicotyledons such as uh, cabbage, turnip, etc. The plants inoculated with the uh, vector along with a normal uh, you know, cauliflower mosaic virus uh, provide the genes uh, which are needed for the cloning vector to be packaged into virus proteins and uh, spread throughout the plant. So, they are inoculated with the vector DNA along with a normal genome. So, you will have a normal genome carrying the larger amount of interest and the vector DNA will provide all the genes which are required for the packaging and formation of the columnar viruses which are there. So, just like phagemids which were uh, using the uh, which were utilizing the properties of the bacteriophages as well as plasmids the same way these viruses uh, have been improved upon so as to carry a larger gene of interest and still be able to uh, replicate and cause the uh, you know and spread uh, across the uh, and can be packaged into the viruses that can be spread throughout the plant. Another type of vectors which are used in case of uh, plants is the genti uh, virus vectors. Now, what are genti virus vectors? They are the natural hosts that include. So, the natural hosts uh, include the plants uh, such as maize and wheat. Uh, they are the uh, potential vectors uh, for these and other monocots. So, they are very important because now they are uh, again you know they are very very significant plant crops the maize and wheat plant crops and other monocots they can be utilized for transformation of such uh, plant, uh, plant cells. During infection cycle what happens is that the Gemini virus genome may undergo uh, deletions of or rearrangements that uh, scramble up the additional DNA that has been inserted. So, this is one of the problem that is encountered with the Gemini virus and therefore, it has to be used in a very cautious manner. Because the Gemini virus vectors uh, you know the insertion may, rele may uh, result into the deletions and uh, spontaneous rearrangements which are there. So, you know the authentication of the inserted DNA or you know it can be many it can be there can be a scrambling up of the additional DNA that can be occurring. The importance of Gemini viruses lies in the virus induced gene silencing. Again we will uh, discuss this gene silencing when we talk about uh, in uh, molecular biology we have talked about regulatory RNA. So, gene silencing uh, you know the, the expression of certain genes are aborted or, uh, or uh, you know silenced in uh, certain cells by the insertion uh, by the introduction of certain regulatory RNAs. So, this gene silencing can also be done by viruses. So, these Gemini virus vectors are used to produce the uh, uh, regulatory RNAs that causes the specific target genes to be silenced. So, we do not go into the mechanism as it has been discussed in the molecular biology regulatory RNA. Uh, sessions, uh, but you know uh, the application is that such vectors can be used for such kind of gene silencing which is there. So, that is what we have talked about in eukaryotes about the cloning vectors for yeast, the cloning vectors for plants and now we come to the cloning vectors for mammals. So, in mammals uh, widespread uh, use is for the viruses that are used as the cloning vectors. So, in a similar way as the bacteriophages were used for bacteria or the uh, plant viruses, the cauliflower or different uh, you know the Gemini viruses which are used for the plants. Similarly, various viruses are used as cloning vectors to carry the foreign gene of inter insert into the mammals. The first cloning experiment uh, involving the mammalian cells were carried out in 1979 with a vector based on simian virus 40 or SV40. This virus is capable of infecting several mammalian species uh, following a lytic cycle in some hosts and a lysogenic cycle in others. So, simian, simian virus 40 SV40 was first used to introduce the foreign genes of interest into the mammalian cells. 
Now again, you know, uh, we are just talking about the technique here because we are trying to understand the recombinant DNA technology. We are not talking about the applications which will be taken up separately because when we talked about that there are these are the cloning vectors which we use for creating uh, for transforming plants then why do we in fact use it why do we want recombinant plants to be made. So, you know we have an idea about genetically modified organisms we want to introduce foreign DNA because we want herbicide resistant plants or uh, pesticide resistant or certain insect pathogen resistant plants. So, you want to insert the gene of insert into the plant cells. Similarly, in mammalian cells, you know why do we want to introduce any foreign, foreign gene, into, in gene into mammalian cells. So, uh, one important application is gene therapy because we want to improve upon or we want to you know uh, facilitate the function of certain important genes and therefore cure a person. Uh, for a particular disease. So, gene therapy is very, very important. Then something which is called as gene farming is very important that you want to insert a particular gene into the mammal so that they can be uh, produced so as to you know they can be produced in the mammalian uh, cultures and therefore you need uh, uh, such kind of a thing and that can be later on uh, you know synth utilized or characterized into different, different aspects. So, cloning into mammals is again very important. So, we will talk about in detail about the applications later, but so it is uh, again you know, uh, so it started way back in 1979 when the thought came in and the genes were uh, you know inserted into this particular vector and introduced into the mammalian cell. Now, SV40 map if you see then the genome uh, uh, contains this particular uh, uh, you know uh, the, the early genes as well as the late genes. So, early genes are expressed early in the infection cycle and they are coding for the proteins which are involved in the viral DNA replication and synthesis etcetera and the late genes which are coding for the viral capsid proteins. So, you know the, the timing or the, uh, the of the protein expression in the or gene expression and protein form in this particular vector you know it can be uh, you know at different times. So, whenever this is infected only the earlier genes uh, will be uh, utilized for the production of the replication machinery and later on it will be uh, the capsid proteins will be provi provided for, for the synthesized or replicated DNA to be packaged into protein heads. So, this is the SV40. Uh, apart from SP40, various other viruses are used such as adenoviruses. So, uh, this vector, you know, we are talking about very, very basic vector which has been created. Lots, many improvements have been done on that because you will need a marker as we said, you will need unique cloning sites which are there. So, such, uh, you know, vectors uh, for cloning purposes are then later on improved to have uh, ideal cloning vectors which can be utilized to be introduced into various mammalian cell line as well as tissue cultures. So, uh, this is just the basic or the basic framework from where the mammalian vector system start. So, this is a viruses vector system we have been talking about. Uh, so, there are adenoviruses which can enable the DNA fragments of up to 8 kb to be cloned. Uh, longer than it is possible, uh, than is possible with an SP40 vector. So, as I said, you know, uh, there is an improvement of vector that occurs. So, naturally occurring plasmids are not very good uh, uh, cloning or ideal cloning vectors. The improvements are done, uh, done upon them. So, as to have the selectable markers for the recombinant plasmid, selectable markers for the transformants and, uh, you know, uh, various unique restriction sites and all those things are done. So, as to improve upon the vector, then various other organisms are also explored for the uh, for their suitability to become a vector system. So, both the things are done. Uh, so, as to you know have a good repertoire of cloning vectors that can be used for cloning in again you know various species. It can be cloning in bacteria, it can be cloning in eukaryotic system for, for like we have talked about in yeast, in plants, in higher animals, in mammals, in insects. So, various types of cloning vectors are developed in such a manner. So, certain naturally occurring plasmids are modulated to become ideal cloning vectors and various organisms are explored for isolating more and more naturally occurring plasmids that can be worked upon to produce ideal cloning vectors. So, adenoviruses for example, you know apart from initially SP40 vector was used, then they found out that adenoviruses they can take up large insert size. So, they were also utilized for cloning of 8 kb or more uh, size uh, in vector 
through adenoviruses are more difficult to handle because their genomes are bigger. So again, you know, the difficulties are encountered and moreover, you know, the safety issues are lot many safety issues are there because these are adenoviruses. Then later on what happened was when viruses are used, then disarming of the viruses occur. So disarming of the viruses causing the infection or cancerous uh, properties of the uh, vectors to go, but they are infective and capsid formation and all those properties still remain. So, uh, you know, that is how the ideal or the improvement on the cloning vectors takes place. Uh, then the papilloma viruses are there which also have a relatively high capacity for inserted DNA. The bovine papilloma viruses which causes the warts on cattle are of particular interest because they have an in unusual infection cycle uh, uh, of the animal cells uh, taking the uh, form of a multi-copy plasmid. So, 100 molecules are present per cell that does not cause the death of the mouse cells but however, the molecules are passed on to the daughter cells in the cell divisions giving rise to a permanently transformed cell line. So, again this kind of viruses are very very important to be used because if you want to permanently transform a particular mammalian cell line then papilloma viruses can be used because they will not harm the daughter uh, harm the cells but the uh, gene of interest can be uh, stably uh, located and transformed onto the various daughter cells also. They can also act as shuttle vectors and therefore manipulations can be done in the E. coli sequences and later on transformed into the mammalian cells and etc. Uh, then there are retroviruses, we discuss this later when we talk about the gene therapy and in retroviruses also again uh, you know the gene of interest inserts can be cloned and then they can be used for therapeutic effects of the cloned genes with persist for the some time. So, this is about the uh, cloning vectors in eukaryotes, in yeast, in plants and some of the eukaryotic vectors in that is used for transforming the mammalian cell lines.